Hello, everyone. I saw, I was thinking about today, someone, uh, you know, you get your first Amazon reviews and you read them. And, uh, and already one person said, you know, well, as a memoir, it's very choppy. <laughs> and um, and it's, not a, it's not a memoir, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, it really is not. Some people have talked about it critically that way, but, uh, but it really was intended as an essay collection. And as a memoir, it's, you're right, it's, it's really not a memoir. So uh, a lot of things are not in there. Um, last night, talking to Courtney Sullivan out of Books Are Magic, she was talking about how uh, she was amazed that some people who she thought of as very confessional writers, like Cheryl Strayed, um, talked about how much they haven't yet described. And, uh, and she was like, that's you when you're holding back? Um, but that's sort of, uh, yeah, you know, I really did want this to be a look back across 70 years worth of essays to choose like what I saw as being um, the kind of core, uh, core essays for me. And the way in which it resembles a memoir is something of an accident of chronology and the way that the essays were structured. And then also, you don't want to sound like you're just repeating yourself endlessly every time you introduce yourself to the reader. Anyway, um, thank you all for coming and making time for this. I'm gonna read for a little bit and then I'll be joined by my friend Joe Osmondson. We'll, uh, talk about, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, this collection. And I thought I would read from My Parade which is my essay about the MFA. When I'm identified as a fiction writer at parties, the question comes pretty quickly, did you go to school for it? Yes, I say. Where? They ask, because I don't usually offer it. I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, I say. Over the years, I've received two standard reactions when I say this. The first is a kind of incredulity the person acts as if he or she has met a very rare creature. Some even challenge me as if this is the sort of thing people lie about. And some probably do, though that makes me sad. Some ask if I mean the famous school for writers, and there are other writing programs in the state of Iowa, excellent ones. But I know they're referring to the workshop, and so I say yes, though instantly I feel as if I have been made an imposter, hiding in the clothes of a better man. The second reaction is condescension, as if I have admitted to a terrible sin. To these people, I'm to be written off. Nothing I could do could disprove what they now believe of me. All of my successes will be chalked up to connections. All of my failures will prove the dangers of overeducation. If they ever like a book of mine, they will say, it's OK as MFA fiction goes. I suppose this is just part of the price I pay for having been one of those people, the doubting kind, sure that it was all bullshit. I got my first glimpse of Iowa City when I moved to San Francisco after graduating from college. I told the friend I was driving with to take the Iowa City exit off I-80, and we pulled off into a truck stop. I just want to look at it in case I decide to go to school here, I said. This seems safe to say sarcastically, like saying I wanted to look at the White House because I was going to be president one day. <laughs> I got out, pumped some gas into the car, looked around at the truck stop, and said to her, it looks terrible, let's go. <laughs> and we laughed as we drove away. Even then, I felt a vague premonitory knock that would haunt me. Someday you'll eat those words. But I pushed it away. It was impossible for me to go to Iowa. I would never go, I told myself, and they would never let me in. At Wesleyan, the college I'd left behind, I'd studied fiction writing in the essay, and the three teachers I'd spoken to about my future offered strong opinions. Mary Robeson warned of studying too much. No one is doing anything like what you do, she said. You don't want to mess that up by taking too many classes. Kit Reed was dismissive. Don't waste your time. You just need to write. You don't need the program. There's nothing there you need. Just go write. Only Annie Dillard made the case for an MFA. You want to put off the real world as long as possible, she said. <laughs> You'll write and read and be around other serious young writers. Two against one. The real world I moved to was San Francisco during the AIDS crisis. My activist friends from college were all moving to the Bay Area, getting apartments together going to rallies, protests, marches, direct action, street theater. 
I saw the AIDS activism and queer politics movements emerging as a response to the fight of my emerging as a response to this as the fight of my generation, and I joined with the seriousness of a soldier. My friends and I were people who knew AIDS could kill us all, and we were fighting against those who believed it would kill only gay people. To this day, I can't tell you if we were trying to remind them of our humanity or their own. My time there felt more like a preview of the end of the world. I would stay two years. I moved to New York in the summer of 1991 for the love of a man who lived there. I had a job waiting for me courtesy of a different light, the LGBT bookstore I'd worked at in the Castro. They had a New York store as well and arranged for me an employee transfer. My new bosses set me to work cataloging the contents of a warehouse in Queens that had belonged to a mail order gay and lesbian bookstore that a different light had acquired at auction. After the chaos of San Francisco, New York wasn't much quieter, but this job was. It was like going to sit in a padded room every day, a room padded with books. Sort of like this. If I went to San Francisco with something of the seriousness of a soldier, I left with a soldier's bitterness. I had seen friends beaten by the police and hospitalized or arrested and denied their AIDS medication under the pretext that they might be taking illegal drugs. I'd been profiled by the police, baselessly suspected of plotting against them. When one of the groups I belonged to had asked me to find out if my then boyfriend was a police plant, and this hastened the end of our relationship, I don't think he ever knew he was under suspicion. At least he never found out from me, but I knew I wanted to leave. After all that, it was nice to sit alone in a quiet room every day surrounded by books, and there were thousands of them, books I knew alongside books I'd never heard of, spilling off the shelves and out of boxes. They ranged from pulp pornography paperbacks to Vita Sackville West first editions to the works of the Violet Quill. My literary heroes were mostly women writers and thinkers, Joy Williams, Joan Didion, Anne Sexton, June Jordan, Sarah Shulman, Audre Lorde, Cherie Moraga, Krista Wolfe, writers who were political as well as literary, their work was in this room, as well as that of their predecessors and teachers. Muriel Rookeiser, for example, whom I discovered in that warehouse, and whose poetry I still love. I hoped, like them, to find a way to fuse my work with my belief in the possibility of a better, more radicalized world. Slowly, I became aware that, for me, a young gay writer who wanted to write, well, everything, poetry, fiction, essays, this time in the warehouse was an education I could never replicate and that the catalog I was creating was a catalog of what kinds of gay writing had succeeded and failed, what the culture allowed and what it did not. For every writer like Gore Vidal, Gertrude Stein, James Baldwin, or Susan Sontag, there were so many others no one knew. The fame of the well-known writers seemed to me a protection against the void and thus worthy of study. How had they managed to survive against whatever it was that had erased so many others? Two of my literary heroes, the artist David Wernerovich and the filmmaker Derek Jarman, were quite publicly dying of AIDS at this time also, facing another newer kind of erasure in the process. And I feared increasingly from the work I'd been doing that nothing was likely to save them except posterity. It was clear their impending deaths, the result of the epidemic, were in some way welcomed, if not wanted, by the government. AIDS was not God's punishment, but the government in action around it certainly was the government's punishment kind of de facto death squad composed of the conservatives who were incredibly in charge of these public health decisions instead of the medical establishment. Though the medical establishment had its own problems in the form of for-profit health care. Those exposed, those in danger of exposure, all seemed likely to die because it was too expensive to save us. Structural death, a preview of the approach conservatives would take for the next 30 years. Back in San Francisco, a certain beat poet used to come into the bookstore and move his books from the poetry section in the rear to the new books table up front. After he left, we'd move them back. Sometimes I'd let them stay a while. Other times what I thought of as his pettiness angered me. But here in this warehouse, I understood him. Fame seemed like a terrible, even a stupid thing to want. But it also could protect you from vanishing forever, especially if you were a gay writer, already disadvantaged when it came to publication, much less posterity. Fame would push your book to the front table, whether you were there or not. The question was always, how do you become famous? The best and only honorable way, to my mind, was to write things people wanted to read. I'd made some progress on that front. Since arriving in New York, an editor at a publishing house invited me to lunch because he was interested in whether I had a novel based on a travel feature I'd written for a magazine. I was also interested in this question of whether I had a novel. And I'd shown up to that lunch, cocky with my hair in a blue James Dean pompadour, wearing a ripped black t-shirt and black jeans. My tweed-jacketed new friend smiled in the dark pub as he sipped his water 
We somehow got onto the topic of the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which he had attended. Underneath my performance of San Francisco queer punk cockiness, I took mental notes as he told me stories about Michael Cunningham, one of the few male writers I admired then. His story, White Angel, which had appeared in The New Yorker, a part of his novel, A Home at the End of the World, was the stark marker against which I measured my own ambitions. The dishy story I still treasure from this chat is how Cunningham would go running at Iowa and smoke galoises afterwards by the track, and how this led the other students to call him French Cigarette. After we graduated, we all moved back to New York, the editor said. This I especially stored away as important, all these writers from New York heading to the Midwest to study writing and then returning afterward. I knew Cunningham had punctured what I thought of as the gay glass ceiling, all too visible to me there in that book warehouse. I began to wonder whether his going to Iowa was part of that, and if it was, if it would work for me also. Such were the calculations of a young man who didn't yet know that gay men had been publishing in The New Yorker before him, that it guaranteed nothing, that there was no guarantee except the one possible if you wrote and got in front of at least one other person. Everything was possible then. I'll stop there. Alex, um, thank you so much for inviting me to join you here tonight. Thank you for um, writing this book, which I've just been reading and rereading since I first got a copy of it. Um, to be honest with you, I wanted to start with the essay on tarot. Um, and I'm a little nervous, Alex. So I went ahead before I came out and pulled a single tarot card from my deck. <laughs> and I was wondering if you would, and I was wondering about how the talkback would go. So I haven't looked at it. Can you give okay. me a reading? <laughs> you really didn't look at this beforehand. I didn't look at this before. <laughs> All right, well, uh, it's the tower. Not going to go great. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, it's the tower. The tower, whether it's good or bad, depends on which side you're on, right? Right. Um, it's the overthrow of injustice. Mm. So, if you're on the side of injustice, then that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Are you reading me, Alex? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, um, your essay on Tarot is really beautiful. And you talk specifically about its power to tell stories, including how it tells us stories about ourselves that we might not want to see. And this actually becomes a huge part of your book, unearthing the hardest things in a life. Um, and what you say in the book is, um, what, you, what will you let yourself know, right? But I also see Tarot, which is about cycles, highs and lows, and it's also about melodrama as a model for how you built your other novel, Queen of the Night, which you don't really talk that much about that much in this collection. Um, but they're connections. And my favorite was that you mention um, being able to talk about um, your abuse as a child as a gag coming off your mouth after 13 years, which is also one of my favorite scenes in Queen of the Night. So just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the storytelling power of Tarot and how it helps you build stories and understand yourself. And then maybe a little bit about the reading that centers um, the end of that essay by Rachel Pollock. So I, I started using uh, the Tarot as a, as a young person who was afraid of the future um, with the kind of childish belief that it could help. Um, and and then I gave it up when it freaked me out. And then I went back to it when I thought that I could understand it better. And then I stopped doing it again for a while when I felt like I'd just gotten kind of baselessly obsessed with the wrong markers, that I was looking so much for some way that a reading would matter that I was missing what was actually happening in my life. Um, so the question is like then, why would anyone use that to help them write? <laughs> you know, and I think um, there is a way in which it's very dangerous to read for yourself, and that was the biggest lesson for me of that time mm -hmm. is that I really needed to, if I had questions, to to probably go to someone else who mm -hmm. also could read rather than to try to read for myself. Um, how many of you here have read tarot cards? And how many of you have had your cards read? So you kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, so the way that you can use it for writing, I think, is uh, you can use uh, you can use it you can use the different uh, reading formats as writing exercises, mm -hmm, if you like. Mm -hmm. And you can even draw cards uh, toward that. And mm. 
Um, but for example, the Celtic cross layout is a very famous layout and uh, it asks questions that the cards answer. Questions like, um, what is the, was it, what is at the center of this? Right. Um, what is the root of it? What is the crown of it? What is the recent future? What is uh, coming into the near future? Right. Um, what are the ways that the world sees you? Uh, what are the secret allies that you might have? Mm. And so on. And those are all good questions to ask about a character mm -hmm. as well. Um, to think about, you know, uh, in relationship to the story, just how um, these kinds of these kinds of writing get mm -hmm. put together. So it's I think that's the sort of um, that was something that I learned from Rachel Pollack also, mm -hmm. who is the she's the tarot master uh, extraordinaire I think of in terms of like our living one of them in terms of living tarot experts, and she's also uh, she's also an author. Uh, of uh, literary fiction and speculative fiction, um, and so when I, when my editor for that essay, uh, you know, asked me if I would get a tarot card reading for it, I thought of her mm -hmm. as the person who made the most sense, and I think her reading was it's unbelievable. Yeah, when you get really there, perfect. and it sort of even taught me something about how to read mm. cards in the process, mm -hmm. how to interpret them. Right. Now when I read the cards, I look at the cards as uh, archetypes in a story and I ask mm -hmm. myself, like, what is the story the cards are telling? That's right. And, uh, and I try to keep away from whatever I might want to project onto. You don't find the, the projections cards. useful sometimes and it might tell you about your desires or longings? Well, I think the, there's a difference between a projection and an intuition, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. I think I try, to, I try to sort out the difference between those. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about the cover photo, where it was taken, when it was taken, why, um, and the, all the photos on the inside. Um, and I am just disgusted that someone so sexy is also so good at writing. It's gross. Um, that's very funny. Thank you. Um, uh, so these these were photo booth pictures taken uh, at the Deadwood in Iowa City. I had a boyfriend at the time, we were long distance, and uh, you know, I'd come out of the San Francisco zine scene and had made zines, and uh, now that I was send sending love letters, I made like zine love oh letters, God. with like uh, photo booth pictures that I would then sort Marry of lay me. out. Marry <laughs> me. Sort of, I think we were, I think at the time with zines, we were kind of imagining what would become the internet mm. in a way, but um, that's probably... Uh, that's probably making a little too much of it, actually. <laughs> but it was fun. But mm -hmm. that's essentially what what they. So in the in the photos, I'm kind of rehearsing my faces for mm. this person. Interesting. Um, you give us some insight in the book into how books get marketed and how the sausage is made. And one of the things you say <laughs> is that it would have been advantageous had you been the first Korean American author. And then when a Korean American author emerged, you said, well, so you had a teacher tell you, well, at least you can be the first gay Korean American <laughs> author. Um, it, Cause it would help sell books, right? Um, she but, believed it would be advantageous for me to be the first. But, your book, I didn't believe it would be. And your book is a lot about how lonely it is, right? And so I, my question is about mentorship. And you are known in the literary community as a great mentor, and you mentor ton. I mean, you're so generous with your time and resources and knowledge. And even this book is kind of an act of mentorship. Uh, so what role has sort of taken on that literary mentor? What role has that played in your career, and your life? Why do you choose to give so much time? Uh, and why is it so important to mentor younger writers? Well, um, let's see. To start back at the beginning, I think you know the the very first Korean American writer that we can find at this point in literary uh, these kinds of literary investigations is Young Hill Kang, mm -hmm. who uh, who was publishing in the 1930s and who was a protege then of uh, Thomas Wolfe and Wanna Guggenheim uh, and. Uh, and still, by the time that I was writing, nobody knew who he was. Mm. So 
to the idea that there was an advantage in being the first, mm -hmm. there is no advantage in being mm -hmm. the first. <laughs> um, uh, I think it was, and part of the part of whatever loneliness that I felt then was in part because I didn't know he existed, mm -hmm. and there was at the time, you know, Asian American studies as we have it now uh, was still pretty, uh, pretty nascent and was definitely more of something that was happening intellectually in the West Coast and not mm. so much on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Even now, the East Coast lags behind. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this weekend in uh, in the new Tea Magazine, you know, Hanya Nagihara mm -hmm. uh, has a fantastic feature about um, uh, these two uh, queer Asian American artists who mm -hmm. were uh, taken from us too early by the AIDS epidemic that um, that it's like a really significant part of uh, of that feature that I think mm. everyone should be paying attention to. But that's again another like they they died before I could find their work. You know, like I arrived in New mm. York maybe a couple of years after they had died, mm. and by then I I was not meeting anyone who was talking about them, and we still didn't have the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, which is another thing that I think about in, in relationship to these kinds of contexts of like continuity mm. and uh, you know is is how how we make these bridges across history and erasure to find the people who are doing this kind of work, what their struggles were, what their stories were. Um, in any case, uh, the I'm no longer the first or sorry I'm not I'm still the first. I'm no longer the only. Uh, openly gay Korean American mm -hmm. author, which is a relief. There's one mm -hmm. other. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, his name is James Matson. He just mm -hmm. debuted last winter. Um, fiction writer. Fiction writer. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm still waiting for others. <laughs> you know, I think uh, with my Korean American writing students, I notice they have a pressure often to. Um, I think for all Asian American writers, we have a pressure to be successful in this way that our families will respect. Mm. And usually being writers isn't <laughs> one of those choices. Um, and much less uh, any part of the arts. Unless, of course, mm -hmm. it comes to certain kinds of arts, like, uh, like say, being a piano prodigy right, or right, a violin right. prodigy mm -hmm. or, you know. Um, but, but being a, a famous writer is not really thought, of, or being even just a writer who's not famous <laughs> is not considered like something respectable. Right, right. Um, I think that's starting to change, mm. but it's still very difficult. Mm. It's still so a conversation I have with my students now. You know, I think one of my great pleasures now is working with a lot of young, openly queer Asian American students who are uh, experimenting with, uh, you know, their identities and their ideas and the work that they want to make and the things that they want to do, and uh, and I love that, and I I feel like the the future I've been waiting for is finally arriving, and so that's a great pleasure to me. Yeah. And I guess that's part of why, you know, the mentoring, I, I, it's difficult. I think you, there can be a lot of pressure to m for you to mentor other people in different contexts, and I always, my advice for other mentors <laughs> is to only give, only to give when you can. Like, yeah. it's that you'll often be <laughs> pressured to give at a time when you really cannot, mm -hmm. and it's easy to feel like you should just because that's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's a disservice to to yourself um, to always only give. Mm. So just, it seems weird to have to say that, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of need out there also. Yeah, um, I feel like this book, um, a lot of your writing in this book in particular, deals with subjects that remain somewhat taboo in the literary establishment. Um, gay sex being one, sexual abuse, HIV, AIDS, relationships across difference and age. Um, but I find that the book really resists the reader's desire for abject confession and spectacle. In a, <laughs> in well, a, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I would say more even than Edinburgh, uh, it withholds a lot of information. Much of the confession is given in exposition as opposed to in scene, which we find in the novel. Um, how did writing fiction allow you to invent detail 
And how did writing nonfiction push you away from that into the aftermath of detail and into the years you talk about in the book that you spent purposely forgetting and running? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm, I mean, I think, uh, what was the part about detail at the end? Um, the exposition versus scene. Oh, yeah. in other words, the use of not kind of a novelistic treatment. Yeah, yeah. But I find in the in the essays, like we don't get the scenes of the horrible things. We get sort of the definition of what they turned your life into. And in Edinburgh, we have the scene and the trauma and the rupture uh, and not as much recovery. Right. I think um, so the big differences there are are in part like what you can write about in fiction versus nonfiction mm -hmm. and the limits of that and even the legal limits of that. You know. So, you know, part of why Edinburgh is a novel is that I wanted to write about the difficulties of what I'd gone through, but I also wanted to write about it in a way that ethically managed me telling uh, a story about what I understood versus me telling someone else a story when they might not have wanted that story to be told. Mm. And so uh, the scenes were invented as a result uh, instead of uh, you know, being quote unquote uh, drawn from life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an important distinction to make. And I think you know, one thing that has meant a lot to me over time is the number of people who went through the sort of the original scandal that I was a part of um, and who've read the book and have found it meaningful and have found meaning in it. Um, and that has meant a great deal to me that I was able to give them something out of, out of that book. Mm -hmm. um, so here I was really more focused on trying to describe like my relationship to all of that, but I don't, again, I didn't want to, I didn't see the point in delineating a lot of the, mm -hmm. the things in question in, in, in this context because because the novel already exists, mm. and I really was talking about it in relationship to that. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, that's essentially why I did that. I think that, you know, the, um, the, the, the question you're always managing for yourself as a writer is like, what does, what do you need to present to the reader to prove uh, the veracity of what you're telling to them, mm. right? How is how does the reader experience the verisimilitude on the page? Mm -hmm. Is it because the action is vivid? Mm -hmm. Is it because you have convinced them that is drawn from your life or from a character's life? Like, how is the convincing done? Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the more obvious ways of creating that uh, can actually create a great deal of boredom mm. um, and uh, or can work against the writer um, in other ways that are mm -hmm. perhaps unanticipated. Mm -hmm. And so it's always the question of what convinces and what doesn't and why uh, is always something that you're managing in a story, whether mm -hmm. you're telling the story through fiction or nonfiction. I have a follow-up exactly on that, actually. I find that you know, an essay collection, one of the hardest things to do is have some sort of continuity. And we've talked a lot, uh, you and I, about how you do that in subject matter, but I also find you do that in voice, that the essays have vastly different crafts. Like a, we have a long lyric essay on a rose garden and a straight up BuzzFeed listicle, right? But yet the narrator's voice is consistent regardless of the other craft choices. And I'm kind of, and the narrator's voice feels like an authority, but not an authority that is falsely constructed. I would hmm. sort of follow this narrator anywhere. So I'm sort of wondering about, was did that come from the editing process of putting all these pieces together? Is that something that you sort of, that takes a lot of work is what I'm saying. And, and at what process, at what point did that work come in to make these essays seem as though they have a unique author, even though they are such different uh, in, in terms of, so different in terms of their craft? Hmm. Well, I, that's a good question. I don't, <laughs> uh, I think the answer I would probably give is that form is always about something that makes the piece possible. Mm. Uh, and, it, and that's really the only purpose it has mm. is that it gives a shape for the voice. Mm. 
So whether that is a listicle, as you put it, or a lyric essay, mm -hmm. um, the it's if the voice finds that that is the form it needs, mm -hmm. then then the voice is in a sense uh, the one in charge of it <laughs> and uh, and is controlling the concert, mm -hmm. as it were. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I do think of it, I think, always that way. Is you know, I think of it in relationship to uh, something that. Um, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name right now. The new book is called The Friend. It's about a dog. Yeah, Sigurd Nunez, thank you. Um, Sigurd Nunez uh, said, you are always looking for the tone that makes everything possible mm. when, she's talking, when talking about a piece of writing, that the writer is searching for a certain way that things sound on the page, and suddenly the, the work moves forward out of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's something that I was when she said that I thought yes that is always what I'm doing. Mm. It's uh, so I think some writers like Deborah Eisenberg they will write m many drafts of a story from different points of view. Mm. For example, looking for a way that uh, a way that the she finds that tone. Um, I think for me, I will try different forms for something, mm. and and find find it that way. And the voice. Uh, so I have a question about, um, I mean, th some of the pieces in the book that were most powerful to me were uh, early on and about the uh, ACT UP activism years. Uh, and one thing that I think um, I've noticed is that a lot of the original ACT UP members have sort of pushed back against the younger generation of, of gay youth sort of coming up um, for, for sort of not remembering or being politically apathetic. Um, and I feel like you're writing helps make present and it helps us remember um, the, the stakes of that time, the stakes of that era and, and why a activism mattered and what activism could do. And I was wondering what role this memory might play in our current and ongoing political struggles. How can that memory teach us sort of ways of being with one another and making activism moving forward? Not to it's ask funny, too big I a don't question. <laughs> I don't really ever meet the apathetic ones, but really? I suppose it's also because I basically just stay in my apartment <laughs> with, my, with my husband or, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, plus the, the young people I meet are very engaged politically, mm. um, very inspiring to me, uh, very thoughtful, very smart, know a lot about their history. Mm. So I, uh, I think, you know, the, and I remember those same activists back when we were all a lot younger, pushing back against older people who are apathetic yes. and unpolitical. And so they will just always be pushing back yeah. at the apathetic no matter what, yeah. I think until uh, their last breath. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> so that's just who they are. Mm. Um, uh, as for what we can learn, I think, you know, I was thinking about this recently. I There was a time when I really never believed that my government cared about me and I was fine with it. Mm. I mean, I was fighting against it, but I didn't, it didn't hurt my feelings. I wasn't like, oh, they want to kill me and it, and it hurts my feelings. Right. I was right, just right, like, right. they, they want to kill me. It's like just how this, this is. Yeah. And so like during the Obama years, I, I sort of like crept over some weird line where I was like, oh, some, some small government approval. Well, I feel so much better now. And then, <laughs> then the administration changed and I thought like, oh, I remember when they hated us more. And I, um, and I still kind of do, and I think, yeah. uh, and I, I sort of had, it's been useful to, to construct this because I've been able to think back to who that person was mm. who like, you know, was too cool to go home and check his voicemail, much less check email, <laughs> which didn't exist then, or like, you know, uh, and, and who also just uh, like knew that the government didn't approve him and was fine mm -hmm. with it. Um, and, uh, you know, you just, the the spirit I took on then was you just keep moving forward to, for the thing that you know is right, mm. you know, and I think that's the same spirit that I'm trying to en engage with now. I think the difference now is that um, a majority of people share my political beliefs. Mm. Mm. We just don't share political power at present. Mm. And I think the most dangerous thing that we could all do at this point is to believe that we don't have power mm -hmm. um, or that we can't have power because... Uh, because we did and we should. Mm. And 
uh, right now, this current administration is trying very hard to alienate us from mm. uh, the mechanisms of power mm -hmm. and to get us to believe that we are powerless, that we are a minority, that we don't matter. Mm -hmm. And none of that is true. Mm -hmm. It's just like them lying from the top of the White House. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to take it back. Mm. And I just, you know, you are, you went from someone who's like, oh, the internet didn't exist then to like the best person ever on Twitter. <laughs> what is that? How is that transition? How did that happen? How is that? What does that feel like? Does it does it also just feel like right? Because I feel like sometimes my tweet, my Twitter just feels like writing. It feels like a writing exercise to take this big lofty idea and put it in 140 characters or to make it. I never made jokes before Twitter, but now I like try to make jokes in my writing because Twitter taught me how. So did what has that been like that transition and you engage so much? Do you feel like it takes time away from your writing or like it feeds your writing? I have been so ambivalent throughout the process mm. of the development of the internet. <laughs> um, uh, I remember the first email I ever sent was to my friend Corey Sika, who at the time was living in San Francisco. And the email was something like, is this how we do it? <laughs> <laughs> I got that from my mother. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, you know, that was like, uh, that was, 1994, mm. maybe, 93, um, from, like from Iowa to back to San Francisco. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I've had people tell me how much my blogs mean to them mm -hmm. or my, how much my Twitter feed has meant to them or my Facebook presence or whatever, and I'm always like, oh, thank you. Mm. I hate myself for doing <laughs> that. I'm so glad that it helps you. <laughs> um, and I remember uh, when I went to see a Korean fortune teller in 2014, he said to me, you have a lonely bird that follows you around. Oh, God, no. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, oh, that's Twitter. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh. It, oh, no. <laughs> and, uh, the metaphor is too I, apt. I was, like, I was like, I just have to I sh so I, keep feeding it. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think of it as like, Twitter, I think it was like, my text message relationship with the planet. Where I'm uh -huh. like, you know, it's a kind of like, hey, are you up to like everyone? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and there is a, a sort of, you know, a way in which I, you know, I begin when I began it in 2008. Uh, the link to it off of my blog at the time was like, uh, you know, links of interest and bitter asides, and that's still pretty much yeah. like how I manage it. Um, uh, every now and then I say something sincere um, <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, you know, I think it is, I think we're at a place now with our digital lives where I don't know that it's useful to think about like does social media take away from writing or contribute to it, mm -hmm. et cetera, because so many people are using it to live now in some ways, like if you're writing fiction and you don't actually know how people interact on Facebook, the limits to what you can describe and what you're writing for fiction are actually mm -hmm. suddenly quite significant. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't know what it's like for someone to have a Facebook meltdown or to suddenly <laughs> like, you know, put their account to deactivate their account and everyone's wondering if they're alive. Or know, if they were like, blocked. Like right, did you block me? Or, oh my God. Right. You know, like uh, you have to know all those things to, yeah. to write social realism now. That's you can't Ugh. you can't write social realism now without social media. Yeah. That's just how we are. Oh my God. Um so it's it's not the same as it used to be. Someone mm -hmm. um Someone also, like at, at the Muse conference in Boston, they said to me, you know, are you worried about how you speak out politically in, on social media, how that affects your readers? And I was like, my readers follow me because I speak out. That's my right, brand. Right. Like, I don't, they're not here for me to just be, like, kind of quiet about stuff. Right, like right, that's, right. That's not why you're yeah. here, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that, like, you know, the, uh, I'm just kind of an ambivalent, bitter, loudmouth, <laughs> Um, <laughs> and uh, who's like uh, probably should be sleeping more <laughs> and uh, in any case th this is all happening in the middle of all of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question uh, one thing that came up a lot in the book about learning not just how to be a writer. I think the book is a lot about writing, but it can be extended a lot to all different art forms. It's really how to be an artist and how to be a living artist and a politically engaged artist. One thing you talk about is talent versus hard work. Uh, and you talk about 
imagining yourself as a talented young writing student, you say, I had resented the idea of being talented. I wanted to work, work I could honor. And Annie felt the same, talking about your mentor, Annie, uh, Annie Dillard. And I noticed you wrote this in the past tense. Uh, later in the book, you say, I was told I was talented. I don't know that it did much except to make me lazy when I should have worked harder. Uh, I'm wondering at this point, uh, with as many students as you've taught, if you still believe that writing is mostly hard work, and if maybe isn't the ability to work hard and to persevere sort of its own talent? Sort of. I'm, I'm thinking of a, when I'm early on in my writing, my teaching writing career, rather, mm -hmm. I, I was teaching at Gotham Writers Workshop, which I think of as the mash unit of creative writing, because you, you can't like turn anyone away. <laughs> and like m much love to all of my Gotham students who might be here in the audience or any of you who have <laughs> taken that. Um, it was a great place to teach because uh, you you were constantly confronted with uh, the whatever false beliefs you had about mm. uh, about teaching writing, or at least I was. And I remember there was a young woman who she took my class three times in a row. Mm. And if she had told me that she was going to do that at the beginning, I would have said, "Please don't <laughs> <laughs> do that," because her first stories were uh, were not charming or fun or. <laughs> Uh, well made and um, and didn't show signs that they might eventually <laughs> become better. Um, but by the third class, she was my favorite mm. writer, and she was like Alice Monroe from Florida. And mm. you know, like if and I and I still keep hoping to see her stories appear somewhere. And mm -hmm. if she's out there somewhere, I hope that um, that's going to happen. But I I did ask her. I said, "What like what are you?" I just have to ask you, like, what is change for you because it's, it's, you're so different from when we started mm -hmm. and she said I get up every morning before I go to work and I write for two hours and then I go to work wow and I was like okay yeah that'll do it yeah <laughs> like, um, and she said I don't have I don't have a husband I don't have children uh, and I just work my insurance job in Jersey and I take the ferry and I just get up a little earlier and write and then I do that five days a week and that's what I do and I was like that's what you do. do. So it just, I think it's, um, you know, the, the, there's a, I, I've had very talented students mm -hmm. who vanish. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I could go through my Facebook now and leave messages on their wall today. Mm -hmm. I know I can know their names. I could just be like, hello, what are you doing? Where, like, where are mm -hmm. your stories? You know? Where are your stories? Um, uh, and who knows why they're not writing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and I have other talented students who are writing, mm -hmm. um, some of whom are in the audience right now. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, I think if I, if I knew why the ones weren't writing weren't writing, I would mm -hmm. do something. But all I can do is try to tell these kinds of stories in public and mm -hmm. hope that it reaches, if not them, people like them. And, yeah, I mean, one of the other things you talk about is how success can, it's what both talent and success can actually get in the way of productivity because you don't persevere and sit down and do the hard work, right? Right, I and mean, I think also, you know, when I'm talking about writing, what I'm also talking about is changing the world and changing the culture. Mm. And when I'm talking about mentoring, I'm also talking about that too. Wow. So like my teaching, my mentoring, all that is about like changing the culture. It's all about a kind of activism yeah. that has become like the, the work of my life, yeah. you know? So, uh, that's like, it's not so much, even just calling it productivity makes it sound like right. something possibly neutral, but yeah. like the For difference between, um, you know, a certain kind of story or literature existing and it not existing, uh, can be profound, you yeah. know? And it, I'm thinking of like, even just with this book, a friend of mine told me recently that she brought it into therapy and that it, it allowed her to talk about things that she had never talked about. And, you know, I just thought, when she told me that, I thought how happy I was. Mm. Like, I'll, I'm sure I'll get reviews that will be whatever. I'm sure some person on Amazon will say some obviously mistaken thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But like, I can bear it all because my friend is a different person now. Yeah, I, and I that's because I wrote that essay. So I had the I brought I had the same experience bringing it into my therapist and being <laughs> like this this page this page made me understand myself wow. differently. Yeah, um, well, and glad. I think you know 
in, in living and imagine living an artist's life or a writer's life, that's a pretty high bar to set, it, changing the world, right? But one of the things you talk about in the book all the time is that your mentors challenge you to imagine yourself competing against the best or imagine yourself rising to the level of the best. And I sort of that think that that's the gauntlet you've thrown down uh, for the rest of us. And I have time for one last question of my own before I throw out to the audience. And it's so another little story that happened between Alex and I, and it's about mentorship and um, images in the book. And in the book, Alex talks about advice he was given by Annie Dillard to whenever you're in a bookstore, go to where your book would fall on the shelf and put your finger there. Uh, and I did that for the first time downstairs here at the Strand. Uh, and I texted you a photo of it. Uh, and I got a little misty. And then I couldn't afford anything, so I turned around and left. Um, so why is the writing one of the central questions of the book? You could have written a, a book or chosen essays that were focused on other aspects of your life, and yet we really are dealing with how to live a writer's life here. So sort of what was the thing that made that the nucleation point for the, for the book and the title? I I mean I think it's also very much a book for readers, you know, because it's sort of uh, to the extent that there is any narrative across the essays, it's about going from being a reader to becoming a writer to becoming a teacher of writing. Um, but there's lots of other things in it. Um, uh, I I mean uh, the title essay I chose as a title, I suppose it was a bit tongue in cheek. It was meant to be a bit of a joke about that question that you always get at readings, which is how, how autobiographical, autobiographical is this? Is this? <laughs> and the great thing about this tour is that literally no one will ask that question. <laughs> I, uh, so. I really wanted to open with it, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, because I think that that's a way of talking about a book that is a way of not talking about the book. Mm -hmm. That it's a way of uh, engaging with the book that doesn't engage with the ideas in the book or the, uh, the ideas that the writer hopes to bring up with the book. Mm -hmm. um, instead, it becomes a kind of, it turns your novel into a sort of yearbook with pictures missing. Mm. And like, <laughs> like no, one, no one wants that. Mm. No one wants that. Great. With that, I think it's time to open it up for questions from everybody. If somebody wants to go first, I know it's daunting. I'll bring you the mic in the back. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering if you felt more embraced by the uh, the Korean American slash Asian American literary world uh, versus like the uh, LGBT gay literary world. Uh, I don't. I would say um, it's been a really comfortable three way relationship for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and that there's been a lot of crossover. Like the first people who reached out to me from the Asian American Writers Workshop were queer writers, queer Asian American writers who were like, hey, come hang out with us. And, um, and we, you know, in that effort, that first, those first hangouts turned into the anthology uh, takeout that the Asian American Writers Workshop did, which is a, a historic uh, anthology of Asian American queer writing. So, um, so there was a lot of, there wasn't really like a lot of, I didn't experience a lot of disjunct initially, at least at first. You know, I was also very much like embraced by uh, the, the sort of the social scene around uh, writers like Edmund White, who is one of those, he's like the, he's like the gay bishop of New York, you know. Um, and, uh, and certainly Patrick Merla, who's here in the front row, um, who edited uh, the anthology Boys Like Us, uh, which was a kind of his historic anthology of uh, gay men's coming out stories, um, was, was a part of that scene. And uh, you know, his interest in me as a writer was profoundly like, uh, transformative for me. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I don't think it's, I didn't really have uh, a sense of trying to you know, there was, there was, there's always like the person who doesn't remember you, but that's New York, right? <laughs> like, you know, where, where you're like, oh, we met before, and they're like, we have, and and you, you know. are, and now I'm the one who does that because I, 
I meet like thousands of people, but you know, it's, uh, uh, I think one thing that I, I would say is that both were present early on. Someone asked me like, what is it like to be, uh, a, what is it like to be a, a, a gay writer? And I said, they throw, <laughs> they throw you the parade before you get to the stadium <laughs> instead of after you win the pennant. Like you get like all this kind of community and support in advance. And I think it's also true of, of uh, at least if you are part, part of the Asian American Writers Workshop, it's also true there that there's a lot of uh, wonderful community and spirit around both in here, at least in New York City. So if you're, if you're here, I would suggest trying to hang out with, with both. Anyone else have a question? I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, coincidentally, this is also relating to you being a Korean-American writer, um, not to harp on that. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm curious if you are engaged with what's going on right now. Obviously, uh, you know, Korea is very much in the news, and if you as a Korean-American voice are, um, you know, involved in that, and if any thoughts on that. You mean uh, like recent noise about nuclear war, unification, et cetera, well, yeah. because of the administration? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's funny. I think that I don't, I was, well, I was in, I was actually in Korea this summer when Trump first started doing his like saber rattling around North Korea. And I was literally like sitting uh, in the airport in Seoul, getting ready to fly back, checking my Instagram, and people were leaving comments on my Instagram, were like, are you afraid? And I was like, afraid of what? <laughs> you know, like, and so then, like, whenever someone says something like that, I think, oh, I should check Twitter because something is happening. So, um, so then I checked Twitter, and, and then I spent like about an hour or so uh, before my flight and then like waiting for my flight to take off thinking about like what would it be like if I died here um, if it really got that out of control like would I be happy with it would I be okay with it and I was actually I, the answer was pretty remarkable to me which was that I would be okay with dying there it's sort of like uh, which was an interesting answer to have as I left um, I, I was there to interview uh, Park Chenuk, the Korean film director for T Magazine, and um, and so it seemed, I guess, like a suitable ending to the visit. <laughs> that I would be like, "What if I died here? Would I be okay with it?" Like, the whole visit had felt a little bit like being in one of his films, and you know, the the woman who took my passport as I arrived had the same eyeshadow as uh, the woman in Lady Vengeance, the sort of like red eyes, and. Uh, and so I, like from the beginning, I had been like, I am basically in one of his movies. Um, I, d I don't know that it's my, my role exactly as a Korean American though to try to address the situation as much as it is to kind of speak out on, uh, on, on the things that I can understand in moments like that. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't, I'm wary of those moments when a writer becomes, uh, can become like, I think it's important to speak out politically. I think it's important also not to try to assume the role of a politician, which is a difference. Um, like I don't want to suddenly be transformed into a senator nobody elected, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, and so I think you know I try as much as possible to clarify when I encounter things that uh, people don't seem to understand or or what have you. But I don't know I don't know how to have a role really in the in the process at this point with the, it's very difficult to know what is real with Trump uh, because so many of the things that he says are unverifiable or false. And there's always, it seems, a process apart from him that people aren't even telling him about um, as a way of trying to protect whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. Um, and that alone is, like maybe it's just saying that, acknowledging that is, is enough right now. I don't know. Um, in the back, yes. Hi. Well, um, do you ever daydream, imagine 
about your stories being like told in other mediums, like Edinburgh and Queen of the Night specifically are so beautifully theatrical. But do you ever daydream about that? And forgive me if there's already like a movie deal happening, but that I don't know about, but oh, any medium, not necessarily film. Um, I, I certainly, uh, I, yeah, I have thought about it, encouraged it, uh, encouraged people who are interested in it. I still do. Um, part of the daydream involves me not being involved directly. <laughs> um, like, I don't have to write the script. I don't <laughs> um, but, uh, but that someone else has a vision for doing it, certainly I would, I would be interested in engaging with that, have been interested in it. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's been various fits and starts along the way. Uh, the, some, the, that sort of like the best thing that never happened to me sort of story where, you know, like Elmo Navar was, his company was briefly interested in Edinburgh, but then decided it was too close to bad education. And I was like, uh, you know, like, um, and certainly like uh, an Almodovar adaptation of The Queen of the Night would be amazing. Like, uh, that would be something that I would love. Um, certainly while I was interviewing Park Chinook, I was like, what if he adapted Edinburgh? That would be, you know, like the dream of my dreams. Um, but uh, all that is still like out there waiting to happen. Any questions on this side of the room? I feel like I've been favoring the other one. Not to put anyone over there <laughs> off from asking a question, of course. No last questions or anything? I'll bring it to you. Hey, um, I was wondering, I know there's a lot of young writers trying to get exposure and I was wondering what you think when they're occasionally offered the chance to get their writing out there, but for free, like unpaid writing, are they being taken advantage of, or is that ever a worthwhile trade for the hypothetical writer in question? <laughs> for the hypothetical writer in question. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know if it's, does Alexa still exist as a website, the site that charts the traffic of other websites? Does anyone know this? Sort of. Um, when I would be asked about contributing to a website for free, the first thing I did was look at their Alexa rating to see if they actually had any traffic. Um, uh, if you're going to be, if someone says that they're going to pay you in quote unquote exposure, you have to make, you have to hold them accountable for that. You have to ask them what is your plan for, for putting the work out there. And it's not, it has to be more than just like posting it on the internet. Um, uh, do they have, do they have money to have it properly copy edited and edited? Do they have uh, a design team that will make it look good? Uh, if they have money for all of that, why don't they still have money for you? Um, uh, you know, those are the kinds of questions that I ask people. And I always ask for money as on principle because I do believe uh, oftentimes, uh, I always believe in asking for something because you never know when someone will say yes. Uh, you shouldn't assume that they'll say no. And then also a lot of times when I ask for money in those scenarios, I'm often the first person who has and it's so depressing to me and so I want all of you to like think about making that your own mission to also <laughs> always ask. Always ask, always ask for more money than they offer you. Um, if they're interested in you at this price, they'll be interested in you uh, maybe for a little bit more. Um, uh, usually they aren't going in at their top price they're going at it what they think that you'll accept. Um, and, uh, and it's easy as a young writer, even as an old writer, to be so grateful that you're like, oh, thank you for being interested in my work. Of course, I'll, $50 sounds great. Um, you know, like, you just can't, you can't let yourself slide into that. It's, um, it's terrible, because you're working so hard on the thing uh, anyway, and, and that's time you don't get back in this life. And so you're not just selling your work for free, you're selling your life for free, and you have to think about that. Um, it's a standard in literary publishing, with lit mags in particular, that you would get paid like in copies, and certainly like one thing you can think about inside of say an academic context, like if you are on the tenure track, you can think about like will this publication assist me in going up for tenure? Will this publication assist me when my you know chair asks me for my report on what I've published this year? You know, uh, and uh, those all those things all matter a great deal because um, they can turn into raises and promotions and the promise of tenure. Um, and so, in that context, I think 
that's another thing to weigh against it. You may not get paid f it, there for that thing, but you get paid in another way for having done it. You know, um, but not ever not everyone has that as a context for that negotiation. Does anybody have one last question? Bring it to you. We'll do two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you just gave a bunch of really great advice, uh, but one of the things I'm always curious to hear other writers uh, tell me is what's the worst advice you've ever been given to then use the opposite and do? Hmm. I wonder. I mean, I've definitely had some bad advice over the years. I'm trying to think of like, I think, uh, mm, I, I think I would, at some point I remember being uh, sort of essentially scolded by a workshop for trying to write about uh, political activists. And it wasn't really in the context of advice exactly, but it was kind of like, you know, uh, why are you trying to, you shouldn't be writing about politics, you know, was the idea. And, I th and I'm thinking about this a lot because I think only in America do we think that you could, you could skip that, like that, and that it would be okay. That would be an acceptable way to, uh, to write about something. Like every other country in the world expects you to include the political lives of your characters. Um, they, they all expect their writers to speak out politically. They all expect their writers to be political. Um, uh, only in America is it like considered brave to be political um, and uh, instead of ordinary and I really want it to be ordinary so because that's what we obviously need <laughs> we need it so bad okay anyway that's my response to that I'll take one last question over here oh I'm sorry yeah. we'll go one more <laughs> yeah. okay um, I wanted to know, hi, hi. Um, I wanted to know if um, you ever resisted being labeled as an Asian American writer or an LGBTQ writer, did you, um, was it something that you didn't even think about? It was just something you just accepted and your books would go in the LGBTQ or ethnic fiction area um, or did you, was it something you ever tried to hide? Uh, like in say writing about characters who were not maybe uh, their sexual orientations were hidden or their race was hidden? Well, I, when I was closeted, I closeted my characters, um, but I was closeted. <laughs> I was in high school and I wrote a play, a terrible play um, based on, I wrote about this actually for, it's in the essay that just came out uh, Tuesday on Long Reads uh, called The Changeling. And it's sort of attempt to get into the minds of you know, so this phenomenon that I know fr from my own experience that I see in my students where you know, you're starting out as a, a writer and you write stories where no one has an ethnicity magically. Um, and uh, and it's a, it was, uh, I had to really like push myself against what I felt like was this way in which it was too complicated to talk about my identity on the page. And uh, and why I f why I even felt that, and so the essay is about this like process of self interrogation that went through in, in leading up to what was my eventual first published story, which was about a Korean American woman who goes back to Korea to visit her family's ancestral shrine, um, which was a kind of way of imagining what my sister what that would be like for her when she did it, um, and. Uh, and so that was like it was interesting to me that 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 first published story was was when I also like managed to claim all of those pieces of myself, you know, and that my first published novel likewise was when I was able to own both like my Asian American identity and my queer identity together. Um, so I would have I ever tried to hide it in my public career? No, never. Like, um, if anything, I've been pushing to have people acknowledge it. Um, you know, I think that uh, that's been more 
of a difficulty for me. Like, I remember going to the you know the Gay Asian Pacific Alliance meetings when I moved to San Francisco and having the organizer walk up to me and say, "I'm so glad you chose to identify," and I was like, <laughs> ch "Chose?" You know, because I'd felt so targeted my whole life. I was like, "What do you mean choose?" Mm -hmm. And he was, he was like, well, I mean, you could pass as white if you wanted to. You don't really have to, like, let anyone know that you're Asian. And I was, like, you know, really <laughs> shocked by that. And, uh, but this was just sort of like a, you know, it's really not been uh, a part of my career. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, I, think, I do think that those sections that you're talking about of a bookstore, they matter, right? They're how we find each other. But the point, the point is to be in both, to be in that section and to be in the main part of the bookstore, you know, not to just be in the one and not the other. So that, um, uh, I know it's an obligation that puts a lot on bookstores, but, um, but luckily we are in a huge bookstore, <laughs> for example, right now, and a beloved one. So, um, in, uh, yeah, in the back. Hi. Um, so I'm not a writer myself, but I've always been really interested in the conversation around um, the responsibility of writers to the subject matter that they're writing about beyond just the artistic process of, of writing the piece. Um, and you know, for the type of writer that you are, I know for me reading Edinburgh, I wasn't just like reading someone else's emotional experience. It was like I was having a really emotional experience throughout, it really brought up so much for me to the point where it's like I almost had to recover for a little while afterward. And um, I'm wondering for you, how do you feel about whether or not you have a responsibility, and if so, what, to the experience of your readers? And along with that, if you have found, as a reaction to your writing, any of your readers expecting that from you and how you've responded to it? I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean by responsibility to the like reaction? Like responsibility, yeah, to the reaction to be able to comment beyond what you've written, um, to be able to um, have something, say, of use to a person who's read your work if they feel like they might need something as a follow-up from the emotional experience of reading your writing. Maybe a, a referral to a mental health provider in the area. <laughs> Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, no, <Just> <laughs> I've <laughs> never. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. Like, uh, I remember a, a student uh, uh, about ten years ago trying to insist that I put a trigger warning on a story that someone was workshopping um, for the class, and I refused uh, because I said. You know, I don't want this person to feel singled out. Uh, either we all have trigger warnings on all of our stories, um, or we all accept that these things might be triggering and we, have, we take some responsibility for it. But I certainly didn't want this person to feel like they had done something uh, wrong, quote unquote, um, in doing that. Because part of what writing workshops are about is teaching people how to write about these very difficult things. Um, to take responsibility for it. And so instead, what I did was I built into the conversation around the workshop going forward this idea, you know, that uh, people are working this way, the work may be triggering, to be aware of it, going into it, and to give yourself room for whatever reactions you might have. But um, I, so no, I've never, I've never really thought about, about that. I think, um, you know, I wrote I wrote the novel to be cathartic and not traumatic, you know, um, and I don't. I've never had anyone write to me and say that they found the novel traumatic. I've definitely had people write and say that they found it cathartic. I've definitely had people say that it gave them that they, it took them time to get through it, that it was difficult for them to read, all those things. But uh, but also the novel doesn't hide what it's about in the back, so I don't know that I need to do more than that as well. Um, and I think part of the struggle to write it for so long was the belief that writing about it w would be wrong, that we be wrong to describe what was in it, that, uh, that people would not want to read it. And, uh, and I really wanted people to think about uh, the reasons why those kinds of things happen, 
and and the ways in which uh, different forces play a role in that. Um, so that's I think that's just the task of I think as readers, uh, I, certainly when I'm reading something by someone else, I I take responsibility for my reading experience um, and for my reactions to it, and I I hope other people do too. Um, I do urge people to take care of themselves, but I don't know. I've never thought about doing more than that. Well, thank you all so much for your questions. And thank you so much, Alex, for being here with us tonight and writing this book. Uh, let's give Alex and Joe a round of applause. Thank you.